Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV. We've got a great show planned for you tonight. We've got your comments. We've got your questions that you've submitted to us over the past couple of weeks. We're also going to be taking a look at what it means to find a fake SD card. What kind of red flag should we watch mm -hmm. for? And why does it even matter to us? Stick around. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Recordings are trusted only to solid state drives by Kingston Technology. Revive your computer with improved performance and reliability over traditional hard drives with Kingston SSDs. Category 5 TV streams live with Telestream Wirecast and Nimble Streamer. Tune in every week on Roku, Kodi, Plex, and other HLS video players. For local showtimes, visit Category5.tv. Category5.tv is a member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Cat5.tv slash TPN and the International Association of Internet Broadcasters. Cat5 TV slash IAIB. Category 5 Technology TV is on the air. Episode number 570. I'm Robbie Ferguson. I am Sasha Rickman. And if you are already a patron, well, hey, just want to first of all say thank you very much for supporting Category 5 TV. We had a hard drive crash. We just before the show, we had a light bulb blow up. Explode. Which is you think a light bulb blows up, but in a studio, light bulbs are really expensive. And so we have these kinds of expenses that, uh, right. that come up all of a sudden, and then they have to be dealt with. So our patrons really help us to be able to... Uh, to afford those kinds of little, little needs as they come. Yeah. And did you know it only takes $1 a month to become a patron? Yes, I did know that. Yes. It's incredible, really. You're supposed to act more surprised. Like, what? what? Just $1? $1? But I bought a coffee today that. that cost me $2. Exactly, right? Right. So if everybody were able to come together and say, hey, I'll give a dollar a month to Category 5 TV, then all of a sudden, all of the expenses are covered, and we can take this thing to the next level, folks. Right. So we do have some hardware needs right now at this very time. Um, so I'd encourage you, if you haven't already done so, check out our Patreon page. It is patreon.com slash category5. And, of course, you can also visit our tip jar if you want to throw a little extra in there. Uh, it's simply donate.category5.tv. Which is good. That one's good. But I feel like you want to do Patreon because, because of the extras you get from it. Right? Like what? Like vlogs like All vlogs. vlogs behind the scenes vlogs. vlogs and some would say what is a vlog that doesn't even sound like a word <laughs> it's a video log i guess is what it means but um basically you get to join me behind the scenes see what's going on learn about upgrades and changes here at the studio before they occur learn right. what we are going through here behind the scenes and what it takes to make category five happen uh, right I think that's a really cool thing. Yeah. Now, that's sure. not to say, like, everybody can watch this. This is a free broadcast. Like, there is nothing. Yes. And, and no matter. Always will be, too. No matter what, we love you regardless of anything. It's true. Um, if you give $0 a month, $1 a month, $20 a month, it's fine. It's just that it's helpful for us to know that the money's consistently coming in so that we can do things consistently like pay the rent. Yes, and I hate asking for money, and so I want to move on. Okay, let's go. Know that I am with you there, okay? okay. So if you're thinking, oh, they're talking about money again. Ugh. No, I want to say thank you. I want to say, hey, I encourage you to become um, a part of that, but let's move on. Let's, yes. Because I hate talking about it, too. Um, okay. We've got to take a really quick commercial break. Now, when we come back, we're mm -hmm. going to be talking about um, SD cards on Amazon and eBay that are fake. Can you believe that such a thing exists? <sighs> Unfortunately. Can you imagine what that could mean? We, we've also got lots of viewer comments yes. and viewer questions that we're going to be sharing with you tonight as we pick up on our second part of our viewer question extravaganza. Don't go anywhere. For a limited time, get your hands on limited edition shirts from the Category 5 TV network. These high quality shirts are manufactured by Teespring, a fundraising website, and your purchase will help support the shows we produce. Get yours today and send us your pictures to be featured on the corresponding show. Visit cat5.tv shirts to support us and get your official network shirt today. Cat5. 
Shirts.com.tv slash shirts. Welcome back. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Sasha, are you ready for a sad story? I am ready for a sad story. Okay. Now, this is, I'm going to completely anonymize this story, but okay. this is absolutely true. So, a person who was doing a family favor was asked to film the wedding of a relative. Uh-huh. And being the videographer and the photographer in the family said, I would like to do that for you. Right. But what do you do before you shoot a wedding? You make sure that you've got enough space on your SD cards. Yes. Because you're shooting on your, your DSLR in this case, or maybe a hand camera, and you realize that I don't want to run out of space. So what do we do? We get on Amazon, we get on eBay, and we find a card that has a lot of space that's not going to break the bank. Right. And then we go and we shoot the wedding. In its entirety? In its entirety. And, and then what happens if that SD card doesn't work? Taking it one step further, what happens if that SD card is fake? Then you hope people took pictures on their cell phone. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Hold, you've probably got everybody in the congregation holding their cell phone. And it probably takes pretty good video these days. Yeah. But getting that footage and oh. making it stable it's probably not going to be the same quality that that's for is sure. a heartbreak yeah this how does it happen right well i can imagine it happens with trust right it happens with trust and lack of experience like i would just order an sd card because you see a great deal and you know a great deal when you see one right i just scroll through the comments like the first four or five and i'm like ah, oh, other people like this i'll buy it <laughs> yeah okay yeah so like and i'm telling the, the real truth about sure. who I am, right? Like, I will impulse buy without asking you first. Okay. I should ask you. No, you don't need to ask me, but uh, <laughs> tonight we're going to look at some of the, the red flags that we can look for Okay. in this particular scenario of buying an SD card. And, of course, it transcends a lot of different things. Now, taking your approach of looking at the first few comments and, and things like that, the first few reviews, looking at the star rating, the problem that we run into with that is that we get a lot of pop-up fly-by-night stores right. selling on eBay and selling on Amazon that... I have only been around for a couple of weeks, so mm -hmm. there's red flag number one. Right. But they get other people that are part of their scam right. to rate and comment on the products that they're selling. Right. Okay? So backing up a little bit, what is a fake micro SD card? So it's not that it's fake in that it's not actually an SD card. No, it is an SD card. But what they do is they'll print on it that it is a certain capacity, even though it is not. So in the case of our wedding videographer, uh, they were shooting on a 256 gigabyte micro SD card. I'm going to bring up Amazon here and I'm going to do just a quick search like you might do for a micro SD card in that capacity. So 256 gigabyte micro SD and here on Amazon. So know that this is not about Amazon being untrustworthy. This is that we as consumers need to realize that when we're shopping online especially, we have to be the quality control in a lot of ways. So right. we have to watch for red flags. We have to be careful. And it's not Amazon's fault. It's not eBay's fault. This is the nature of the world that we live in, where sites like these allow other people to sell products through their service. Okay? Right. So in this case, unfortunately, it was fake. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that in just a moment. So first, of, first thing that we see is SanDisk comes up. And SanDisks are... In this capacity, 200 gigs is $69.50 Canadian. Uh, there's a 256 gig, which is what we're looking at. It's $105.61, okay? Mm -hmm. So the first thing that we know is that the first couple that come up are in around the $100 range, okay? If we keep going through the list, we're going to see that the cheapest one in that capacity, now here's a Samsung here for $117. And so we start to think, whoa, these are really expensive. So what other options are there? So let's sort from low to high price. And whoa, 
lo and behold, ladies and gentlemen, a 256 gigabyte card for just $9.99 Canadian, which for those of you in America, that's about $3. <laughs> okay. So red flag number two, not possible. Okay. Mm. So just so you know, not possible. Let's look at this card itself. Looking at the picture of the card, we notice it's not Kingston, it's not SanDisk, it's not tra Transcend, it's not PNY, it's not any brand that we can recognize whatsoever. No. When this first went up, it had four or five stars. It's starting to go down as people start ordering it. Let's look at some of these reviews. And we can see that, do, 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 do. Okay, first one. I used this in my phone for the weekend, transferred files onto it, and then it corrupted everything. <gasps> Think about that for just a second. Just hold that in the back yes. of your mind. It worked fine. So you plug this in and it's working fine. Now for our videographer, they plugged it into their camera. And of course, like anybody would do, they shot a couple of videos around the house. They tested it. It's working great. Yes, I got a deal at $9.99 for a 256 gigabyte card. Right. Jumping back to the profile, let's see what else we can find about it here. So there's nothing really about the brand or what it is. If I highlight over top of the seller, we can see that um, they have a high rating, so that's good. Oh, this is compare offers. No, that's not the seller either. So that's not even the seller. So a well, little bit deceiving. A little bit deceiving, right? Because that is a different offer from a different seller. Um, so looking at this, of course, we see it is extremely cheap. Mm -hmm. It looks like a legitimate card, and it uh, does actually physically look like a legitimate card in person when you hold it in your hand. But we know that it's missing a couple of things. So another thing that we notice is that, okay, at this capacity... It doesn't have any markings that it's like UHS, ultra high speed, which it most likely would at this capacity, but right. um, certainly no brand name is offered. So my red flag, my biggest red flag with this one and why I would move on is that it's too good to be true. Okay. Right. So then we think, but I can buy this. I'll take that risk. It's only $10 and Amazon allows me to return things if they're not good. If it doesn't work, if I have a problem with this card, I can send it back. Right. Okay? Because the card itself to my pocketbook is only worth $10. Right. What is that wedding video worth to you? Yeah. Okay. It's everything. What are the photos that you take on your phone worth to you? Those things are priceless in a lot of, a lot of times. Those things are priceless. You can't replace them. You can't, mm -hmm. in a, the case of a wedding and pictures of the family, you can't retake them. Right. Right. So what happened here? So this is, this is an example of a, a very, very likely fake card on Amazon. Having ordered this card mm -hmm. and shooting video, as I said, it worked. This, the first review said, at first I started transferring files to it. So it worked. Right. But then all of a sudden... It corrupted the data because the card itself, now I physically had this in my hand and I plugged it into my Linux machine and I ran it against FDisk and I did a little bit of math. The card showed that it was 256 gigabytes. According to the report from FDisk, right. it's a 256 gigabyte card. Now looking a little bit closer at the sector count of that card and doing a little bit of math and figuring out what the card really is is physically, not what the file system is telling me it is. Right. The card was 2.4 gigabytes. Okay. How does that happen? So a malicious party has manufactured cards that are two gigabytes in capacity. Right. They've relabeled them as 256 gigs. They've actually connected them to a system that has overwritten the file tables to make it look to your system, to your camera, to your computer, as though it is 256 gigs. Everything that you see about this card shows you that it's 256 gigs. Right. As you start working with it, as you film video on this card, it works until you hit 2.4 gigs. 
and then it keeps working because your camera still says this is a 256 gig card that's what the card says it is in the file table in the file system table and it keeps recording but where's the data going into the abyss of yeah. nothingness and so then having shot all that video on this card yeah plugging it into the computer after the event and realizing I only have 2.4 gigabytes of video and everything else is lost. The file system says that they're there mm -hmm. because remember the file allocation table is only a reference. It's like a, it's a list of all the files that are currently on the card. So the file allocation table tells Windows when you plug it in or your MacBook when you plug it in or your Linux machine when you plug it in, here's a list of all the videos you took. Here right. they are, a whole bunch of MOV files and they amount to 100 gigs. But you try to click on one and then the file allocation table looks for the data on the card, can't find it and spews out either an error message or just a bunch of garbled video oh. because the data itself Is doesn't exist. Was anything salvageable? No. In this particular case, not at all. <sighs> The test videos before the wedding right. were salvageable. Not what they're looking for. No. So we have to watch for red flags. Again, this isn't a problem caused by Amazon. No. It's the, the nature of purchasing from any vendor like Amazon. Think of Amazon. We've used the example. You use the example of calling them a mall. Right. You walk into the mall and y you don't automatically trust every little kiosk in that mall just because they're in a mall that you trust mm -hmm. because the kiosk is really the person who's selling this product and did they even manufacture it who knows the c company that's selling it may think they've got a real great deal on 256 gig guards right and then maybe they don't know any better oh, what but the a fact heartbreak. is in this particular case the cards were fake and as you can see on my screen a $10 256 gigabyte not megabyte gigabyte card right is not a real SD card. So, it's best to just spend more money and go with a brand you know and trust. Absolutely. Like Kingston. Yeah. Like, exactly like I said. Right. Look for Something the brand you know. in this particular case because we're looking at SD cards. Yeah. Yeah, we're looking at Kingston. We're looking at uh, SanDisk. SanDisk. We're yeah. looking at Samsung. And, and even then, they, they can be rebranded too. Right. So it's a danger. So, you know, how do you possibly know if you're safe? It's like you've got to buy from legitimate sellers. Watch out for that price because if it seems too good to be true, maybe it is. Mm -hmm. And this isn't just SD cards, but this is a good example. We really need to be careful what we buy. We ran into it on the news. Right. There was a, was it a fire, a, a, carbon, a smoke detector, carbon, carbon monoxide, monoxide detector. Yeah. Right. And, I mean, really, in truth, if the test button, if you press the test button, the test button makes a noise, you think, oh, this thing works. Yeah. Because you wouldn't hold it up to something with carbon monoxide spewing out of it to see if it would go. And now you think you would, but who would? Yeah. Who, who has ever created a fandangled carbon monoxide um, box to hook up to the exhaust pipe of their car? when they bought a new carbon monoxide exactly. detector. We just, we don't I do, do You it. just, you press the test button, you see, okay, it's making a noise, you plug it into your wall, and Bob's your uncle, right? Except that. Except Unless they're fake. Exactly. Which was the case, again, on Amazon. Exactly. On eBay, on various other sites that were selling that product. Yeah. So. So, so I hope that through this, that you understand that we need to be smart consumers. We need to be careful where we're purchasing from, the products that we're buying. And certainly if you're going to be shooting something, like in a case of like a wedding or shooting something like that, I always have multiple SD cards handy and right. I always test them first. I will actually, you know what? Here's a good test for you. Put it in your camera and push record and let it run for four hours. Right. See what happens. If you're not sure, like if you've got an SD card and you, maybe you've got a couple on hand and you're, I don't even know, maybe one of these is fake. Why not just run it through a record process for as long as you will ever need to so record just for? So just fill it right up. Yeah. And, see. and then watch back the video and just skim it over and just make sure that everything's good. And then you'll know mm -hmm. whether or not that card is, is good. And there are other, you know, smart ways to test it using DDE and things like that, but not very intuitive from a user standpoint. So you know what? Plug it into your camera, press record, let it record for as long as it can hold, and then check it back and see before you actually need that card mm -hmm. whether or not it's good.
Thank you. We do have to take one more quick break, and then when we come back, we've got viewer questions and comments. Yay. Coming right up. Whether you shop on ThinkGeek, GearBest, B&H Photo Video, eBay, or Amazon, or even if you want a free trial of Audible, you'll find the best deals and support the shows we produce by simply visiting the shopping sites you already frequent by using the links on our website. Visit Category5.tv slash partners for the full and ever-growing list and help us create more free content like this show. Thank you for shopping with our partners, and thank you for watching. Welcome back. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Sasha, we've got lots of viewer questions, comments to cover tonight. Last week, we tried to get through the list, and tonight, you notice we're really trying to rock it out because we want to get through these tonight yes. and especially with jeff not here you know taking up all our time with his banter i know i right? think we can do this i think we can make it happen <laughs> <laughs> okay so j jg electus spotted our review of the power locust headphones and says bought them a month ago and for 35 euros it will be almost impossible to find anything better they sound good for movies also that's cool. So. You remember the Power Locus headphones that we reviewed here on Category 5 TV? They are Bluetooth wireless, 4.2 right. EDR headphones. Yeah. But they also have an FM radio, which I don't know if anyone really cares about anymore, but nice feature, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but it has an SD card reader in it. Which is perfect. Make sure you buy legitimate SD cards. <laughs> Speaking of. So you load it up with MP3 files, pop that in your headphone, and then you're not having to use your phone. Right, which is important for things like on an airplane, where some, some airlines yeah, are not allowed that. to use sure. devices. Like straight up, it's yeah. like ask your attendant if you can. Yeah. Well, that's perfect. You know where I thought, and we've made that comment, you made that mm -hmm. comment before, and, and I thought that's, that's a, great, a great example. But then it hit me when I was jogging that I don't want my phone on my hip. Right. I don't want my Bluetooth headphones connecting to my phone while I'm trying to jog and this thing's slapping me in the hip. Right. No, so now with these, I just load up the, um, the MP3s, but it also saves me on data because True. when I'm jogging, I don't get... I don't, I, I don't have to use my data to listen to music. Right. So it also saves me money. I like so, it. Yes, very, very good. SBS5130 uh, saw a review of the Edifier R1280T speakers. Jeff and I did this review. That was a lot of fun. Yes. I mean, how do you review speakers, right? But they were incredible. <laughs> you got to check those out. Um, they say, <clears throat> impressive product for the money. But I wondered about the brand. So according to Wikipedia, Edifier is a Chinese company founded over 20 years ago. They quickly grew to dominance in their domestic market. Fun fact, they acquired Stax in 2011. Well, what do you know? So now, now you know. Thanks for, the, uh, thanks for the info, SBS 5130. I love the Edifier uh, line of speakers. I really legitimately do. That's, they yeah. look good. They sound great. And, um, and I guess with a 20-plus-year-old company, they've got some... <laughs> Some you know exactly too. you know you're getting a good quality product mm -hmm. jet oh i'm not going to do well with your name let's oh. see joe catino kohler took a that look that sounds pretty close let's see took a look at plexpi.com and wonders what's up if my files which are encoded what's up with my files which are encoded h265 raspberry pi supports that format Note that I'm not mentioning format conversion. H.265 runs in a Raspberry Pi. Question mark. There's all question marks. All right. So the question... If my files, which are... I think I understand okay. what you're asking here. Okay. And is it Hiao? I don't know. Something... We'll call you Joe. Can we call you Joe? Oh, we can now. Um, <laughs> so H.265. So you're using PlexPi.com, which is um, my build for Raspberry Pi to allow you to run Plex on a Raspberry Pi microcomputer. Right. So you plug all your videos into that, and then you stream them to all your devices. But 
if you've got videos that are encoded in H.265 format, now that is a compression format that is a much smaller file, but it is at the compromise that it uses a lot of CPU power to decode it. So if you encode your files in H.264, uh, H.265 format, it will take a lot of CPU to decode. So on a Raspberry Pi, H.265 would not be recommended. Okay. Plain and simple. Because you don't have a very powerful CPU. So I with that being the case, if you tried to stream H.265 video, it's probably going to stutter. Mm -hmm. And that's because it's trying to decode the video in real time. Right. The CPU on a Raspberry Pi is pretty small. I mean, it's not really that's, meant for that. We're pushing the envelope for. already. Yeah. So you might try re-encoding your files to H.264 um, or some other format that is not as CPU intensive as H.265. Do a little bit of research, see what's going to work the best. Um, you might play with different containers to see what, uh, what is going to work well for your environment um, and get into like Raspberry Pi forums and start asking around about, you know, what formats play really, really well on a Raspberry Pi. And then you'll know. And really what it boils down to is finding codecs and, uh, and containers that do not require a lot of CPU power in order to play back. So that, again... H.265 is a smaller file right. at the compromise that you're using more CPU in order to decode it, okay? Right. So keep in mind, if you go with a file that doesn't take a lot of CPU to decode, it's probably going to be a larger file. So that's, that's the kind of the difference. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So so do keep that in mind. You're going to need to use up more space for those H.264 files. Good question. Uh, okay, a couple years back, uh, Kelsey and I did a feature about how to rip our DVD movies, and it kind of comes back to PlexPy, because now that we've got a uh, Plex media server, how do we get our movies onto it so that we can actually watch them from any device? Right. So we start with DVDs, and we import them to our computer, and then put them on our PlexPy system. So uh, we did a video that has been doing really, really well. It was called Rip copy protected DVDs for free uh, with free software for Windows 10, Mac OS 10, or Linux. And uh, Dalek Dancer has some comments. Do you want to read those? Certainly. This process worked to treat. Good to have an explanation as to what we were doing. I tried Wondershare and something else that did not work. On another note, I was thinking of transferring all my DVD collection onto a hard drive. What's the best way of doing it? Since you didn't mention this in the video, also, will you still be able to keep everything from the original DVD, like the extras, etc.? Appreciate your knowledge. Okay. So two questions there. Yeah. Uh, and a comment. First of all, the comment that, hey, this worked? Yes. Excellent. I'm so glad to hear that. One of the comments that we get on that video a lot is, hey, you guys talk too much. That's where I'd point you out, the skimmer at the bottom. And, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, um, because certainly, you know, there's a lot to describe when it comes to that kind of thing. Um, so I, I'm glad that it worked for you, and it's working for a lot of people, and it's helping a lot of people to be able to figure it out. How do you transfer those videos now to a hard drive? So right. I like to have an organizational structure that is quite organized. So what I would do, and I'll bring up my computer here for you, just to, to kind of give you an idea how I would do it. So I'm going to create a folder here. Don't worry, I'm going to show you my screen in just a second. <laughs> I'm just creating it. So I'm going to just pretend this is my drive. So I'm going to call this my drive. Okay. And now I'm going to hop over here for you. So this is my drive. So what I like to do is I like to create a folder on my external hard drive, and I'm going to call this um, Murder Mysteries, right? And then I create another folder, and I call this Sci-Fi, and, and so on and so forth. So for every genre that I might ever want to watch or rip, so I do that kind of thing. Okay, so then once I've ripped my DVDs, I jump into the folder that's appropriate, so there's comedy, and I simply paste it in. So I cut it from wherever the destination is, so if I saved it to my desktop, for example, now I'm going to paste it onto my external drive in that folder, and, uh, and then it keeps it kind of organized in such a way that I can go back to it easily. And if it's a show, then I make sure I number it. So if it's um, like season one, episode three, I call it S01E03, and then the name of the episode or the name of the show, something like that, and, that, and so on. So then when I'm organizing things by title, 
sorting them by title, it's going to show them in order for me so that it's easier for me now to find S01E04, my next episode, to watch it just by double clicking it on my laptop or something like that. Uh, and sorry, Sasha, what was the second question there, the last question? The second question is, will you still be able to keep everything from the original DVD, like the extras? Okay. So I know this isn't your question, but the question has come up. Um, can you keep? Can, and the question, and what that brings to mind is the question that we've had quite a bit, which is, does it cause any damage or make any changes to the DVD itself, the physical DVD? Right. DVDs that you buy that have videos on it are read only. So what we're doing is we are ripping or copying um, and, and making a duplicate okay. of the data that's on that disc. But we are not changing the data on the physical disc itself. Okay. okay. I know that's not your question, but it just kind of alludes to that question as well. Um, so then, yes, right? Then you could just have the extras, couldn't you? Can you have the extras? That's yes. where I'm going with this. I'm like, where am I? Okay. I think then you could, right? The extras are showing as other videos within the DVD. Right. So you look back at that video, the tutorial, and you'll see that we found the one that was like an hour and a half long because we realized that, hey, if it's an hour and a half long, it is the full-length movie right. of the disc. But then you'll also see some other videos that Handbrake has detected that are maybe five minutes long and ten minutes long. And you can preview them within Handbrake to find out what they are. Push play right. and see what they are. And you'll see that those are actually your extras. So then you can rip those using the exact same process and, uh, and just give them a name like extras or behind the scenes or whatever it is that you want to call it um, that keeps it organized for you. So absolutely, you can keep those things. Some DVDs will hide some content. Oh, okay. So sometimes you will not be able to find that content. It is possible. Um, certainly that is often the case on DVDs that have multiple videos on the single DVD. You'll find those in like bargain bins that right. have like four movies on one DVD, for example. Yeah. For some reason, sometimes some of the videos are hidden from the file system in such huh. a way that you can't get them through the tradition. I know Garby mentioned in the chat room about the subtitles, so you could rip those as well. Yeah, Handbrake will actually rip those as part of the video, or you can save them as external files, like SRT is... files, and those files can then be used um, in, in future when you want to use the... the uh, right. So you're not stuck with yeah you're not stuck with subtitles every time you watch it if you don't oh, want no. to right well, like you can if you embed on or them off. yes okay. but if you go with a container that supports subtitling that you can turn on and off or change the language of um, for example M4V okay. would be a container that supports that um, you can embed the um, the SRT the the subtitle format within the video in such a way that when you're playing them back for example in VLC right. you'll see an option that you can change under view, I believe it is, you can turn the subtitles on or off, and you can even select the language of the subtitles if it's supported by the video. That's cool, too. Yeah. Nice. And that can all be a part of your rip as well. That is a, a very good question. That's Dalek the answer. Thank you for it. Um, Bang Ken Tai saw the same video and says, my fearful task at loading my collection of DVDs to the smallest possible way to transport them to my retirement destination in Asia has been answered. I have been battling in my mind what to do. My collection is large and a lot of money invested since they first came out. My outlook was to sell them, which I will know will only bring a fraction of my investment, then buying only a fraction of the main ones which I like um, and buying them as new. Shipping them separate or transfer with me, which is cost prohibitive. This morning, I began my search for answers and this video was the first I saw and the only one I needed to see. I followed the instructions exactly as described and as I'm posting this comment, my very first attempt is successfully converting to my laptop. While it is converting, I will go out and purchase an external hard drive to, sell, to save them in one location since I am sure the conversion is okay. Roku, um, I have, and I will see about Plex later that day. Thank you, guys, thank you guys so much. The cost? Zero dollars. I saw Cube Video to do the same thing, which I played just after this video finished, but 
you must buy the cube and more. Why? These are my DVDs, which I've already paid for. Why should I pay more for the privilege of storing them in a different format? Keep the yak going. I learned a few different tidbits from you guys talking, which helped me out. I'm not that advanced on computer stuff, but if your house is on fire or a loved one is in cardiac arrest, I know without hesitation without what needs to be done. The heart is like a hard drive. They don't last forever. Enjoy life. I love that this guy appreciates the fact that we were yakking and that's yakking and yakking. That's great. You know, Everybody's different, right? And so that's, that's kind of part of it. And that's the fun of having a talk show. We try to, uh, try to give a little something for everyone. And we appreciate that comment. That is a wonderful, wonderful point that you can take your entire DVD collection, right. put it on an external drive, and bring it with you that's as you travel. That's perfect. If you have a, a vacation home, well, you can't bring boxes and boxes on the plane. No. It just ain't going to happen. And if you try to bring them in the car, you're probably going to get hit with some kind of importing taxes oh, and who knows something. what else. Yeah. Yeah. So here you can put them all on a drive. Now, I guess there's the caveat that maybe if somebody stopped you with that drive and plugged it in, they might think that you have pirated videos. So that could be a problem. I don't know how you would address that. Perhaps take a picture of all the DVDs laid out on your floor <laughs> so that you right. can just, if it happened, maybe have that JPEG in the root folder and you can say, look, <laughs> these are mine. I took a picture just to show that I actually own these DVDs. I'm not bootlegging. I'm not illegally transferring files or right. importing them to the country, that kind of thing, Feel right? Like, yes. That's a that's a far stretch for how far they would go, but of course you wouldn't want to get stuck, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So yeah. there is that. So do keep that in mind. That's I think for sure. That's a, thanks the, for the comment. What a great uplifting comment, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I do enjoy life. Thank you. Cheers, Ulrich Kalber wants to know if you can use more than one Stream Deck connected to just one computer. So we looked at the Stream Deck uh, a few weeks ago. This thing is awesome. Can you guys see that? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push a button on it to zoom in. Um, so these are buttons that are associated with our different camera shots. And you can see the picture of me there. There's a, a picture of Sasha. And if I push it, it actually zooms in on Sasha. Hey. And there's a picture of me. And I push that, and it zooms in on me. But the question is, can you plug more than one of these into a single computer to have multiple different uh, macros? I feel like you would never need to, but can Correct. you? Okay. okay. <laughs> Correct. And we showed this during the review. Reason I say that is because, like, if I click on Wirecast, and again, this is it's kind of tough to to show you, but if I click on Wirecast, it takes me into the Wirecast folder, and I've got all these buttons within the Wirecast folder. And then, just for good measure to test, I created another subfolder within the Wirecast folder, and it takes me to another folder. And then I created another subfolder within that folder. Or did I? Yeah, I did. And that's actually taking me into another and yet another, and then there's another button right there. So you can create subfolders within subfolders within subfolders within subfolders. So do you need to have multiple devices connected to one system? That's for you to answer. Can you plug multiple into one system? And while I don't have one to test with Sasha, I would say that the answer is most likely no. Right. And the reason for that is as soon as I connect this Stream Deck to my computer, and as soon as I bring up my broadcast suite, which is Telestream Wirecast, it automatically loads the profile for Wirecast, which I created. And I told it to do that. Right. But then if I plugged in a second Stream Deck, it would automatically load the profile for Telestream Wirecast. Right. So then if I say, oh, well, I want to change the profile, so then I change it to a different profile, it's going to change both of them because they're both Stream Decks on that computer. So right. I don't think it's going to work. I don't have proof of my answer because I do not have a second unit, but, but. That's, that's my theory anyways. It's a program that's running on the computer, and there is no option within that, com within that program to support multiple devices. That's all. Well, there you go. Thank you, everybody, for sending in your questions, comments. We always appreciate it. We love it. Um, and uh, we hope that, uh, that you enjoy it when we bring them uh, to you as well. And hopefully we're able to answer some of your questions. Tonight's was a lot of comments, a lot of great comments. Yeah. Viewer questions and comments, are, like, that's my favorite episode. Yeah. Absolutely. So...
Every do, time we do a show, folks, she says, what we're doing here it's right my now favorite is my favorite. Every song I listen to is my favorite song. Next too. week, we're looking at single board computers, <gasps> and I guarantee... I love that. It's her favorite. Yay. <laughs> Basically, this is just your favorite show. This is my favorite right? show. Exactly. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of favorite shows... It's time to jump over to the newsroom Guess with what? Sasha Rickman. What? That's, this is my favorite part of the show. Is this your favorite part? Because it's all you? <laughs> and right. I just kind of stand over here and switch everything over That's to you? That's right. Is okay. That how it works? <laughs> but you control the, yes. Yeah, well, I can take okay. care of that for you, for sure. Here's what's coming up in the Category5.tv newsroom. Hackers are now turning to in-store kiosks to have your SIM card swapped so that they can access two-factor authentication on your accounts. A security plugin for the Firefox browser is under fire after users discovered it was collecting and uploading their online activity. Linux 4.18 is now available after a number of well-documented hiccups. And you're not the only one feeling run down by the news of the day. The folks at Google apparently believe we could all use a dose of good news at times too. The company has announced it is testing a new Google Assistant feature called Tell Me Something Good that will allow users to hear a summary of, up, of more uplifting news stories. Stick around. The full details are coming up later in the show. Jeff Weston. Yeah, man. You're building a brand new beautiful website. What? Aren't you? No. Am I? Oh, you're a terrible actor. What? This is where acting comes into play. Oh, I didn't know we were acting. You're supposed to act. Okay, fair enough. All right. yeah, I'm building a really cool website. Are you building a really cool website? Just because Jeff is confused doesn't mean you have to be. Visit cat5.tv slash dreamhost to sign up for unlimited web hosting for your website with unlimited email accounts, MySQL databases, the latest version of PHP, WordPress, and more, and even a free domain name registration. It's less than $6 per month, so sign up today. cat5.tv slash dreamhost. This is the Category5.tv newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. I'm Sasha Rickman, and here are the top stories we're following this week. A Bitcoin investor is suing AT&T for $240 million after it allegedly ported his his phone number to a hacker, allowing the criminal to steal $24 million in cryptocurrency. Michael Turpin is suing the phone giant for the value of the 3 million electronic coins plus $216 million in punitive damages after he claims an AT&T employee at a store in Connecticut agreed in person to transfer his personal phone number to a new SIM card despite the account having a high risk protection following an earlier hacking effort. The anonymous hacker then used his access to Turpin's phone, phone number to bypass security on his cryptocurrency accounts thanks to two-factor authentication sent by text and transferred millions of dollars to a different account, an approach known as SIM swap fraud. Turpin claims AT&T admitted to him that the employee in question agreed to shift the SIM card despite the security requirement that they ask for a valid form of ID and having ignored an additional VIP requirement that they provide a special six-digit passcode before changes are allowed on the account. That six-digit extra security step was introduced after Turpin says his account had been targeted and hacked six months earlier through the same approach. That time, he says, a hacker made no less than 11 in-store attempts to steal his SIM information before finally succeeding. On both occasions, the first Turpin knew of the hack was when his phone went dead. The second time, he says he knew instantly what had happened and immediately tried to contact AT&T to shut the phone down, but it was stymied by the fact that it was a Sunday and AT&T's fraud department apparently does not work on Sundays. By the time he regained access, $23.8 million in Bitcoin had gone missing. By failing to follow procedures and giving the extra security on his accounts, Turpin claims that AT&T had broken multiple laws and lists no less than 16 claims for relief, ranging from negligence to breach of contract to insufficient security and providing unlawful access to personal information. AT&T, for its part, has promised to fight the lawsuit. A representative said, we dispute these allegations and look forward to presenting our case in court. Come on now. AT&T has 
I a lot of money. So if they're okay, if they're well. fighting in court, this poor Turpin guy is going to be out all of his millions of Bitcoin. We got a big problem here in this world right now because a company like AT and T may not look at cryptocurrency as a commodity. Right. So, you know, you should have protected yourself. There are so many problems with this. Now, first of all, we're giving the benefit of the doubt to the person who has had this happen to him. Right. Of course, it in itself could be fraud, right? That's Saying, true too. oh, somebody stole my SIM card and blah, blah, blah. That could be fraud. But we're giving him the benefit of the doubt yes. and saying, okay, well, let's, pretend, let's just say that the news story is correct and this actually happened in the way that he described, which right. could happen. Then we've got a few problems with AT&T. First of all, we know that their staff, those who are working at the kiosks, mm -hmm are not necessarily trained in anti-fraud. Right. And if that's the case, why are there not things in place that say, okay, this person is subscribed to our ultimate security package? Right. Nobody, absolutely nobody who works for us is able to make any changes to that account without true authentication. Right. First of all, we know that the ID is a factor. Right. Yes. So... Think about that. Hold that in the back of your mind for a moment. But why is an employee able to circumvent the requirement that is put in place? Think about that for a moment. Right. Okay. So we live in a world of entitlement. People are entitled and they feel entitled and staff are taught that the customer's always right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in... in in this world, we also live in a world that is very well versed at how to use social engineering in order to control those who are on the receiving end. So social engineering is able to trick the victim right. into providing something that is um, giving that person information that can be used to then trick the employee into believing that they are the person. Right. Right. Social engineering can also be used on the flip side with the AT&T employee, remembering that we live in a world of entitlement and we live in a world where AT&T employees are taught the customer's right. Right. And I walk in and my phone's been stolen. I need you to cancel that SIM card immediately. I don't have my wallet. Like, come on. Like, let's make this happen. Like, this has to happen now. I, I, right. Okay. Uh, sorry, sir. Um, okay. Let's see what... Uh, okay. Uh, let, me see, let me see how I can help. Right? Mm -hmm. The employee is a victim as well. All right? Yes. So, AT&T, the company, obviously doesn't have something in place that... <laughs> access denied. Right. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I'm trying to override it, but, but I can't. There, the message on my screen says, first of all, now, it had I, as the AT&T employee, had training in anti-fraud, I'd say, okay, hold on one second, sir. I'm just going to pick up the phone, and I'm just going to call the number for this right. smartphone. Okay. Um, I'm going to, okay, I've got an answer. Hello? Um, okay. What, what's the answer to your security question? Okay, the guy standing here before me didn't know that answer. Uh, what's this and that, right? Right, right. Okay, there's something going on here. I need to push that button under the desk. That's, had I had anti-fraud um, training. training, I would have known to do that. That's obviously, you know, that doesn't not. sound like the case here. So, right. But had AT&T had something in place that says, no, you're not allowed to override this, mm -hmm. it's not possible for the staff member, who could also be in on it, Right. To override this, then it never could have happened. So AT&T is liable. Don't kid yourself. Right. They, they certainly are. But is it true that they also don't have fraud prevention on 24-7? I don't. That seems weird. I mean, weird. it must be because you said it, That's right? That's weird. Yeah. Right? In a world where fraud can happen at any point in the day. I think right? what it comes down to is like kiosks and stores are extensions of mm -hmm. the actual company. 
Mm-hmm. When, when you go in and you order a service, they pick up the phone and they dial into the head office right. and they order that service on your behalf and right. set it up with, with the head office. And really, they're just an extension or a third party in a way, right? Um, so they should not have the power to do what they did. Mm-mm. They should have better training when it comes to anti-fraud. Mm-hmm. But that's not an end-all be-all because you could still have a, a malicious party working for you. Right. They should have something in place that says, no, there is a process. This person had the ultimate security package, and yet the process could be overridden by a, a minion, if you will, somebody yeah. who works at the kiosk in the mall. Oh. How is that possible? There is a definite failure there on AT&T's part. Yeah. Turpin, you have a fight to fight, but you're going to win. Regardless, I mean, I'm, I, regardless of being on his side or not on his side, it's the company needs to realize that this cannot happen. Mm-hmm. This cannot be possible to happen. <clears throat> Taking it to, okay, so completely away from the at and side, mm-hmm. had I realized that my phone, which I use for two-factor authentication, was missing or had gone dead, right. his first step should not have been to call at and Absolutely not. Absolutely not. He should have been logging into all of his services no, I guess he couldn't. Two-factor authentication wouldn't allow him to log into his services. Right. Hopefully those services would have a way to notify, wow. install ESET mobile security, which has anti-theft. That wouldn't work either. If your phone was stolen, it would. Oh, this is a real dilly. So that, no It wonder. all comes down to AT&T. There's nothing yes. he could have done better. Oh, that's a, a heartbreak. Mm-hmm. A security plugin for the Firefox browser is under fire after users discovered it was collecting and uploading their online activity. The outcry began after Mozilla featured the web security extension on its blog with a post titled Make Your Firefox Browser a Privacy Superpower. The plugin, developed by German company Creative Software Solution, bills itself as a tool for blocking malicious pages and phishing sites. It also allegedly logs what web pages the user visits. Shortly after the post went up, uBlock Origin developer Raymond Hill noticed that the plugin was gathering and transmitting the address of visited websites to a server in Germany. Word got back to Mozilla and the org moved to strike the link to web security from its blog and investigate the matter. The reference to the extension has been removed from the blog post as part of the investigative process. The developer of the plugin, Creative Software Solutions Managing Director Fabian Simon, says that the collection of browsing information is only done to check a site against web security's global blacklist. He says his company does not know why Mozilla pulled the link to web security, but Creative plans to submit an updated version of the extension for a review to prove that it is not doing anything untoward. Untoward or not, you're not doing it right. Right, well... That makes me indignant. <laughs> okay, so this, this is obviously not how security should work, but I don't exactly know the answer of how it should. I mean, obviously, well, you can collect your hashes, information and send it, right? Hashes, checksums. Right. You know, like the, the information that I'm entering into my browser should not be transmitted in any no. form that's readable by a server. So they're saying, okay, if you visit a website, your computer now needs to notify our server of that website that you're visiting so that we can then send a response whether or not it's compromised or safe. Mm-hmm. Right? That would be the theory. Right. So that's what they're saying. Okay, well, your computer has to send us that website address so that we can then respond with Whether a Whether or not or that's a good thing, yeah. Yeah. No. No. If you've got a blacklist, so if the, if the service provider has a blacklist, mm-hmm. um, they can have checksums. So they create an algorithm. Right. An algorithm that creates checksums for those web domains that it knows are bad. Right. Okay. And then your computer, the plugin, creates a checksum based on the, f- the site that you're visiting and compares checksums. Right. And in such a way that you're not even sending the checksum to that host server because then they can reverse engineer the checksum that you sent and see where you've been. Which, yeah, it's your private activity. You should not have to send it mm-hmm. anywhere. I, I run NEMS Linux, right. as, as we all know. And one of the 
one of the issues that I ran into, yeah, not an issue, one of the challenges that I faced because my users wanted to have encrypted offsite backup service. Offsite backup service is what they wanted. I knew it had to be encrypted mm-hmm. because I didn't want anyone being able to steal their data. Right. But I also don't personally want access to their data. How do I do that? I want them to be able to access their data, mm-hmm. but I do not want access to their data. Mm-hmm. If I decided to go rogue and access this data, I don't want to be able to do that. Right. <laughs> right. That's how good programming is done. So without getting into the intricacies of NEM's offsite backup service, mm-hmm. The checksum is created on their server, mm-hmm. and the checksum is shared with our server. The encryption is created on their server. The right. decryption key is not shared with our server. Right. So my server now has the checksum which it associates with the user account. So I do have an association and I can cross check whether it's a website address or a user's account information, they're associated. Right. But the files, the data, the information is not accessible. So get a checksum, upload it to the server for the plugin. The server says, okay, this checksum matches this, send it back. Right. Now my computer gets that checksum response and decrypts it using the key that is only available on my computer and not on the hosting server. So mm-hmm. there are all kinds of ways to do this without sending information that's private. And so. we live in a world where there's technology that's way beyond me. I'm basic by the terms of what's available out there. So this creative su- security solutions company is just kind of kindergarten in their approach because they believe what they're doing is right. Yeah. That's why they're saying, oh, hey, well, no, we we'll need just to show know the you. URLs. Yeah, we'll just show you uh, yeah. um, another one and you'll see that we didn't really mean anything by mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. Right. So they don't mean maliciousness in their actions, but it's not, it's, it's not their smart. intent is. Yeah, their intent okay. is pure. I would but their, program, their programmatic approach to security is, ne- is moot. Right. So Firefox just trusted this and threw it up on the... Unfortunately, site? yes. Yeah. Which can happen. Right. I mean, we're looking at you know, a plugin repository and, hey, here's a cool looking plugin. Let's feature it. Let's talk about it. Right. Somebody could feature NEMS Linux and they don't know the inner workings or the underlying code of how it works. Right. Somebody says to me, why is it touching GitHub every five minutes? And so somebody would say, well, why is it touching GitHub Mm -hmm. every five minutes? So I explained, we use GitHub for our update system. And so your system actually checks with GitHub whether or not it's responding. If it's not responding, it doesn't do any updates. If it is responding, you get your updates. Right. But it has to check. But thank goodness there are people out there that are asking send those any questions. Doesn't right? send any information. Right. <laughs> Keep that in mind. So there are people out there checking, hopefully, everything, always. That's it. But not always the case. Yeah. Open source is the way to go. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you got more for me. I do have more for nice. you. Nice. Yes. After a number of well-documented hiccups, Linux 4.18 is now available. The release includes a raft of new toys, including support for the Snapdragon 845 chipset found in high-end mobile phones and a small number of Windows 10 laptops. The inclusion should mean that the normal all wipe that and install Linux comment that follows many a hardware review can now be applied to Microsoft's latest and greatest ARM-based devices too. Other notable enhancements include support for the Raspberry Pi 3B and 3B Plus computers along with some early work on upcoming AMD and Intel graphic chipsets in the form of Vega 20 and Ice Lake 11 chips respectfully. The the gift that keeps on giving, Spectre also gets some attention with mitigations for the V4 variant on 64-bit ARM architectures and V1, V2 mitigations on aging 32-bit ARM hardware. Other hardware such as USB 3.2 and Type-C also see improvements plus new support for a wider array of sound chips. I don't know how Linus does it. I mean, come on. Yay. So. Linux, of course, is an alternate to Windows. Linux, the kernel, Mm -hmm. which is what we're talking about here with 4.18, is taking Linux to the next level and and making it so that it's available on more platforms. 
always Good. improving. Open source yeah. wins again. And the community for Linux itself is huge. And people find ways to make it work better, make it work on other architectures, make it work on new platforms. And they patch Linux's kernel. And then Linus Torvalds, he looks at it, reviews the code, and approves the, uh, the pull requests and releases the, the final product. And so it's a, a real collaborative effort. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's what we're using. Yeah. Works great. Yes. What a good community. Yeah. Love it. You're not the only one feeling run down by the news of the day. The folks at Google apparently believe we could all use a dose of good news at times, too. The company has announced it is testing a new Google Assistant feature called Tell Me Something Good that will allow users to hear a summary of more uplifting news stories. Google says the stories will focus on people who are solving problems for our communities and our world. To activate the feature, Assistant users in the U.S. can say, Hey, Google, tell me something good to kick off the daily briefing of happy stories. Google offers some examples of what the good news may include, like a story about how Georgia State University stops students from slipping through the cracks, or how backyard beekeepers in East Detroit are bringing back the dwindling bee population, or how Iceland curbed teen drinking. The stories are selected and summarized by the nonpartisan nonprofit Solutions Journalism Network, an organization that helps train journalists to better cover how people are responding to problems and how those actions can have positive results. The stories themselves, meanwhile, will be chosen from a wide range of media outlets. Google acknowledges this feature won't be some sort of magic bullet, but the company says it's an experiment worth trying because it's good info about good work that may bring some good to your day. The Google Assistant feature works on any Assistant-enabled devices, including mobile phones, smart displays, or Google Home devices. But I understand it's only in America. It turns out it's only in America, so I read this, right? And America, I, you need good news today. I know. So I, I get in my car, which I hook up to my phone, and then I have Google everything, right? Yes. And so I ask my car, I just press a little button, and I'm like, tell me something good. And it, <laughs> it said to me, I'm sorry, something good does not exist in your area. <laughs> huh. oh, or your region. Sad. Your region. Yeah, I am. Sad. Give it a try on your phone. See how it, uh, see how it works. I think it's a great concept. Yes. And it kind of plays into, remember how Facebook was manipulating people? Right. So that's the dark side of this, where they're posting specific stories to manipulate the, the global mood. Right. Where here, it's a choice to, hey, you know what? I, want, I, I don't want to hear what media is giving me. I want to hear what is uplifting. I want to exactly. hear what's good in exactly. the world today. Okay, yeah. There's a lot of good folks. So here's the thing. I'm like, I, you may have noticed, am I, you know, glass half full sort of person. I don't like to watch the news in the morning because, and I understand that tragedies do need to be reported upon, but I don't want to start the day thinking about all of the ills of this world. I want to help everyone. I don't, I don't not care about you. I just, I'm drinking my coffee and I want to be lifted, right? I need this good news thing to work now. There needs to be balance, I think, yeah. is what it comes down to. Yeah. Like, we need information, but we live in such an information overload right, right now. And when that information overload is skewed toward the negative, because that's what sells news, news I know. ad space. I don't know. What, what sell, what's the phrase now? You can't say sells newspapers. That's true. Because nothing sells newspapers anymore. Sells attention. I don't know. So what <laughs> makes you click on yeah, the clickbait. website. That's it. Yeah. There you go. Um, um, yeah, when it's... We need balance. It's true, because if you were to just randomly poll people out there after watching regular news or listening to regular news, they would probably give you a pretty negative... Pretty glum outlook yeah. on the world. And, and that affects our mood. I mean, if you, if you have a bad start to your day... Yeah, it's not true. There are so many good people out there. I mean, I even I had a patient call me. I work at a chiropractic clinic, and she said, I'm going to be late for my appointment. I can't even get out of bed. But don't worry. My neighbor is going to come over and help me get up. I will be there. That is newsworthy, right? It's newsworthy that somebody out there came over to someone else's house and helped them, I think. Because sure. it's so rarely reported on, and it happens all the time. Or at least give us something that motivates us right. to want to be that person. 
Exactly. You know, because when I start the day and I turn on the news, give me the news, but give me a little positive piece that's going to uplift me. Yeah. I know it's, it sounds cliche and cheesy. Right. But I think... But you can tell the same news story in a positive way, right? So, for example, sure. the beekeepers in Detroit, right? You could have a news story that says, bad, the bees are dying, which yeah. is sad and true. But... You could do that, or you could say, listen, the bees are getting a helping hand and a chance at life because there's these people who are fighting against the, the bad. And so then by taking that good news approach, do you think people would say, oh, wonder if I could do that? Right. That sounds like something I could do. Exactly. Here in Barrie. Exactly. I could have a beehive. How hard could it be? Yeah. <laughs> but um, bum Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so... Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.TV Newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And for more free content, be sure to check out our website. From the Category 5.TV Newsroom, I'm Sasha Rickman. And I'm Robbie Ferguson. It's been great having you here this week. And we look forward to seeing you again same time next week. That's right. Take care, everybody.